Well, hello everyone. My name is Dr. George Papacostas. I'm scientific director at the Massachusetts General Hospital Clinical Trials Network and Institute uh, and also associate professor at the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And I'm going to talk to you today about adjunctive solutions for major depressive disorder. So before I, I begin, as a standard, this is my financial disclosure. It essentially lists all the companies that I've ever worked with that either make medications or devices or try to make diagnostic tests for psychiatric disorders. So feel free to pause your screen if you wish and look at these uh, to your satisfaction. So let me begin by getting a bird's eye view of, of the topic. So how effective are antidepressants? How effective are treatments for major depressive disorder? One of the key studies that attempted to answer this question I'm going to present here. This is a meta-analysis that I conducted along with Maurizio Fava at Massachusetts General Hospital. And we essentially looked at all randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies of antidepressants for major depressive disorder. Uh, and we looked at patients only for adults with MDD. Essentially, the findings are interesting. First of all, when we look at response rates, response rates being the proportion of patients who have a 50% or greater decrease in depressive symptoms, we found that about 53% of major depressive disorder patients achieve response with a single pharmacotherapy. This is patients on average. The interesting part, of course, is that there's also a strong placebo response rate of 36.6%. The drug response is statistically significantly greater than the placebo response, but the placebo response is kind of strong. What does this mean? The downside is that a high placebo response makes it difficult, costly, and time consuming to develop new treatments for our patients. The positive side on the clinical aspect is that if there's a sizable placebo response rate, it means that we as people, as human beings, by achieving a connection with patients, listening to them, understanding them, and giving them hope, optimism, and information, we can enhance the treatments that are delivered. So uh, the question then becomes, we just saw what the response rates are after one antidepressant. The question then becomes, what if you administer a succession of antidepressants? And that essentially is the STAR-D study. The STAR-D study was a United States funded clinical trial, the largest one ever conducted in depression, uh, that attempted to look at the following question. How likely are patients going to get better, major depressive disorder patients going to get better, if you administered a succession of antidepressants, either used alone, through switches, or with other agents through augmentation? Interesting findings here. First of all, on the left column, we see that after up to four treatments for those that needed it, two-thirds of patients achieve remission. One-third do not, consisting a particularly difficult-to-treat population. The second column, we see that 75% of patients achieve a response. We saw earlier that after a single treatment, the average patient has about a 50% response rate. So immediately, what we can deduct here is that after a succession of treatments, that success grows, kind of starts to flatten out, starts to, to taper out. So first treatment, about 50% of patients achieve a response. By the end of the fourth treatment, for those that need it, only three quarters of patients achieve a response. And to make matters worse, almost two thirds of patients stop the treatment because of side effects. So what are things to think about in cases where antidepressants don't work, the first is, has the patient received enough dose of the medication for enough duration? So we look at the record, make sure that they've gotten their antidepressants for at least six to eight weeks at at least a minimally effective dose. The second, is the diagnosis correct? Is the patient unipolar or are they bipolar or vice versa? It's important. Bipolar treatments for the most part, don't work in unipolar depression. Unipolar treatments don't work in bipolar depression. And if there's a psychosis, there's an antipsychotic that's going to need to take care of that as well, in addition to the mood medication for the mood disorder. Adequacy of diagnosis. 
If patients have anxiety or other psychiatric or medical comorbidities, it's more difficult to treat them, so it's important to tackle these as well. It's not only about depression, it's also about the comorbidities. Adherence and tolerability, it's important to make sure that patients understand how to take their medications, how often and when, and that they're also able to do so. And finally, pharmacokinetic factors. In those extreme cases of patients that are sensitive to very low doses or patients that are insensitive to very high doses, that is not only a single occurrence but is a repeating occurrence and makes you suspect that there's a pharmacokinetic factor at play, it's important to try to get pharmacogenomic testing. So let's go back to STAR-D because I want to talk about a particularly difficult area in the treatment of depression. So one of the questions that STAR-D asked was, what was the chances of success if you kept giving antidepressants as monotherapy? Switch, 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 switch. So patients not getting remission two-thirds after their first antidepressant, switching them to their second, three-quarter do not get remission, switching them to their third, 90% don't get remission, switching them to their fourth, 90% don't get remission. Key lesson for all of us, if you've tried antidepressant monotherapy once, twice, after that it's futile. You start to have to think about augmentation with your patients. What are the advantages of adding something to a treatment regimen? Treatment regimens are like building blocks. You can progressively approach success by building on an existing treatment regimen and you may undermine it if you take away these building blocks. So um, let's assume for example that a patient has a partial response to an antidepressant. You may want to add something to it to get them to full remission. If you take away the antidepressant and substitute it, you may lose the partial response and never see it again. You avoid withdrawal symptoms that are commonly seen with antidepressants or stopped. And you may also use the adjunct not only as a building block towards remission, but to target a side effect as well. Example, patient has a partial response to an antidepressant, you add a drug to get them to full remission and to treat their insomnia because that second drug hypothetically is sedating. Disadvantages, adherence, the more medications patient takes, the harder it is to remember to take them. Chances of drug interactions go up. Persistence of side effects is a limitation. If a patient obviously can't tolerate one of these building blocks, you can't build on it. It's an unstable foundation. What are the best, some of the best evidence uh, uh, augmentation, excuse me, and combination treatments for major depressive disorder. The best studied are the atypicals. This is a meta-analysis of atypicals versus placebo when added to antidepressants for major depressive disorder. Each of these agents studied olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine, aripiprazole. Each of these agents individually pooled in the meta-analysis, beat placebo. All the atypicals pooled beat placebo with a clear effect size. This is the, these are the atypicals that have been studied and approved in the U.S. These are the doses commonly utilized. The advantage here, this is the best studied strategy. The disadvantage is the tolerability. Depending on the atypical you use, you may see neuroendocrine disorders like hyperprolactinemia, side effects. You may see metabolic effects like weight gain, increase in lipids, and glucose dysregulation. You may see QTC prolongation rarely. Again, these are agent dependent. What's agent independent are rare but serious things like tardive dyskinesia where your patient has permanent and um, irreversible and abnormal uh, tics, facial tics. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is another one which is rare and potentially life-threatening. Then of course you get more common less serious extrapyramidal side effects such as Parkinsonism and dystonic reactions. These two are agent dependent. So essentially Atypicals, thumbs up for efficacy, but the downside is safety and tolerability. Mirtazapine and myanserin also has considerable data as adjunctive therapy. There are three out of four studies that are positive for mirtazapine or myanserin. These are similar agents. They block serotonin 2 receptor as well as norepinephrine alpha 2 autoreceptor, thereby increasing serotonin and norepinephrine tone in the brain. Three out of four studies show these are effective augmentations. Uh, 
or combinations if you wish, uh, one of the four studies having a considerable methodologic limitation is negative, but uh, I think that because of that limitation, it doesn't undermine the, the, the totality of the data, which here, in my opinion, is positive. So these are the doses used in studies. These are the doses often used. Advantages, thumbs up for efficacy. Again, um, sedating agents. So if you remember the example, if a patient has residual symptoms and insomnia, you could use it for the depression. You can use it for the insomnia. Disadvantages, there can be weight gain here. There could be sedation for the patients who want to avoid sedation, that is. And there's a very rare risk of agranulocytosis, so it's important to measure white blood cell count. Now, um, besides synthetic drugs, medications, there's also efforts in studying other agents as adjunctive therapies for major depressive disorder. So one of these is L-methylfolate. And why study L-methylfolate? It turns out that up to 70% of patients have at least one copy of an enzyme uh, that's associated with poor metabolism of dietary folic acid into L-methylfolate, which is the uh, compound in the human body that, that's involved in methylation, uh, that's involved in um, um, the, the, it's a, the effects of dietary folate in the human body. So when patients have such a copy that's associated with poor um, uh, conversion of folate to L-methylfolate, the idea there is to try to bypass that by directly administering L-methylfolate, which of course is not dietarily available. The theory behind this is that um, in patients without depression, there is enough synaptic activity and there's enough neurotransmitter activity in patients with depression over time because of stress or inflammation or other factors uh, or genetic predisposition, there's, gen there's um, synaptic pruning. Synaptic pruning leads to a paucity of neurotransmitter activity across the central nervous system. The SSRIs try to partially remedy this by blocking the reuptake of the neurotransmitters, thereby making the synapse more efficient. The idea here is that L-methylfolate, which is thought to be involved in the synthesis of neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, can further help make the system efficient by increasing the production of these alongside the SSRI, which seals the synapse to, to the neurotransmitters from, from being extracted or escaping. That was the idea, but of course, the proof is in the pudding, pudding as they say. Uh, we conducted two randomized, double-blind clinical trials to test whether, in fact, this theory is proven true. The first study had 148 patients. The second study had 75 patients. The first study st looked at 7.5 milligrams of L-methylfolate in SSRI partial non-responders versus adjunctive placebo. The second study looked at 15 milligrams of L-methylfolate. This was a multi-center study with Massachusetts General Hospital meaning the coordinating center. The study used a novel design in order to decrease sample size requirements. This is the sequential parallel comparison design. The, sequential, the idea behind the sequential parallel comparison design is that rather than a clinical trial being one segment, you break it into two segments. The first segment, comparing drug and placebo, is used not only to generate a signal as to whether the drug works, but also to prospectively identify placebo responders. Placebo non-responders then, which have been prospectively identified, enter an identical uh, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study in which they are re-randomized to drug or placebo. This enriched population with placebo non-responders has better chances of truly answering the question whether the drug works or not. Here is a schematic. The larger study, uh, 7.5 milligrams of L-methylfolate. The second or smaller study, 15 milligrams of L-methylfolate. And here are the results. The left-hand side, you have the results of the first study where there essentially is no difference in response rates for patients who did not improve sufficiently on an SSRI, who got L-methylfolate added on top, or placebo. The second study, looking at the double dose, or 15 milligrams, the response rate was statistically significant and greater 
for adjunct alpha-folate versus placebo. If you, for those of you who like to look not at response rates, but at change in scores, there was a statistically significant greater reduction in depressive scores with the Hamilton scale for patients who got 15 milligrams of L-methylfolate on top of their SSRI versus placebo on top of their SSRI. Finally, for those of you who liked, like to look at numbers needed to treat for response, the number needed to treat was six, which is very favorable compared to the larger and less favorable number that you typically get with antidepressants, which is from ranges between nine and often ranges between nine and 12. In terms of side effects, rates of side effects were essentially similar between 15 milligrams of L-methylfolate and placebo. Tolerability and safety was not a limitation here. So those are the results of the 30-day randomized double-blind study. Patients for further information who completed the 30-day study were allowed to go into one-year extension uh, on L-methylfolate. And here are the results. 60% of patients who did not achieve a response during the 30-day double-blind achieved a response during the one-year open label. 92% of those did so within the first three to six months. 75% of patients who showed a response without remission during the double-blind phase showed a remission during the 12-month follow-up. And 91% of patients who achieved remission during the double-blind phase achieved recovery during the follow-up. So a sustainability of effect profile similar to contemporary antidepressants. There's no evidence that the efficacy of this intervention is only acute and then tapers out. This is something that's sustained. There was also extensive interest because of the mechanism of action of L-methylfolate to look at different biomarkers. Uh, there were three families of biomarkers. First was obesity, the clinical obvious biomarker. The second were markers that had to do with methylation. And the third was markers having to do with inflammation. So, so here are some of the findings here. You can look at the p-values in the second to last column, and those essentially tell you which of these findings are statistically significant. Just to summarize this slide, BMI was highly statistically significant as a moderator, which means that, yes, the drug was effective, more effective than placebo in the overall population, but in patients who were obese, the efficacy was much, much enhanced, meaning patients who are obese seem to be particularly likely to get better with this medication. Another interesting statistically significant finding was that patients who had less S adenosyl methionine and more S adenosyl homocysteine in the blood were again much more likely to get better with this medication than patients uh, who had high SAMI and low homocysteine levels. And finally, patients who had high levels of 4-HNE, which is an inflammatory marker, again, seem to be particularly responsive to this medication versus placebo. So something going on here with BMI, with this intervention, and inflammation and methylation. Several genetic polymorphisms also helped identify which patients were particularly likely to get better with this intervention. Some of them were in the methylation family, as you can see in the left-hand side. Some of them were in um, other metabolic areas. The ones that were particularly robust was the COMT enzyme. The COMT enzyme, the last two columns on the right, is involved in breaking down dopamine in the brain. Patients who had very active COMT enzymes, meaning polymorphisms that were known to be very active, hypothetically, being patients who had high degradation of dopamine, these patients were particularly prone to getting better with L-methylfolate. So there's a tie here with dopamine production and degradation and the chances of getting better with L-methylfolate. Finally, we wanted to build kind of a, a clinical slash biomarker uh, model that would help identify for future studies which patients were really likely to benefit from this medication. Left column you see 2.74 was the greater efficacy of L-methylfolate versus placebo in all patients. If you looked at non-obese patients, there was actually a small advantage for placebo. L-methylfolate did not do well in these patients. If you looked at obese patients, there were 
very likely to get better with L-methylfolate than placebo. The effect goes from 274 to 4.66 Hamilton points greater than placebo. Some other biomarkers, interleukin-6 also, uh, obesity plus inter interleukin-6 was tested, did not really enhance the signal. Obesity in high sensitivity, CRP, inflammatory marker, slightly increased the signal. Leptin, another metabolic inflammatory marker, further increased the signal. Obesity plus TNF-alpha produced the largest signal in this uh, model. The difference between drug and placebo for patients who were obese and also had high TNF-alpha levels was more than six points on the Hamilton. Just to help uh, the audience understand, in augmentation studies, usually the difference between atypicals and placebo is two points on the madras. So six points on the Hamilton is almost double or triple of that effect. So that's it for all methylfolate augmentation. The dose that was found to be effective was 15 milligrams. The advantages, this was very well tolerated. It's an acceptable intervention because it's part of the human metabolism and some patients who don't like to take medications don't view it as exogenous. Uh, and it may also promote other health promoting, possess other health promoting benefits such as perhaps pro-cardiovascular effects via decreasing inflammation or mitigating some of the pro-inflammatory pro effects of obesity. Disadvantages, we don't know whether higher doses would be more effective. We know 7.5 doesn't work and 15 does, but we need to future studies to answer the question, do higher doses work better? And confirming biomarkers. It's always important to prospectively confirm any preliminary biomarker leads. So that's it. These are some practical takeaways. We have several adjuncts to consider for major depressive disorder. Uh, the ones that I mentioned where there are multiple studies like the atypicals and, and mirtazapine myanserin are some of the best, some of the best evidence. L-methylfolate is a very promising molecule with a, a very interesting positive study and some accompanying promising biomarker data that certainly warrant um, in, you know, further investigation and in, in the research clinic and consideration in the patient clinic. How do you decide amongst adjuncts? You got to think of efficacy, safety, tolerability, patient's treatment history, and patient choice, and try to come up with a solution in collaboration with the patient it's important to do a proper and thorough evaluation even if the patient is referred by a trusted colleague and it's important to understand not to underestimate the placebo effect. The placebo effect can help us as people enhance the efficacy of medications and psychotherapy. And with that I'd like to thank you for, for uh, participating in this educational activity. It's my pleasure.